Well, good morning. We finally end up in the ICU then. And it, I, I guess it's all in the name, critical care. That actually means that if my whole team doesn't pay attention to every tiny detail, we are not going to make a difference. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I pick out some of those tiny details that are very important for our patients. And we will discuss that uh, with you. And to do that, uh, I've changed Luke a little bit. I've made him a little bit more personal. So he's, uh, he's 60 years old now. That's me. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest. That's me. He had a myocardial infarction. Fortunately, that was not me. And he came into the ICU with a classical coma score of three. Unfortunately, that wasn't me either. So when you finally end up after a cardiac arrest in the ICU, there are at least, and I think these three are the most important ones, there are three main targets to get to. And the first one, of course, is hemodynamic stabilization. We've heard a little bit about that, but if you don't stabilize the hemodynamics, you can't expect that your brain will improve. So hemodynamic stabilization is a very important one, and of course that includes PCI, early fluids and inotropes, I'll come back to that a little bit later, and in some rare cases, of course, assist devices or even extracorporeal life support. Then the most important thing in the ICU definitely is enhance your cerebral recovery. And I'll come back to that a little bit later also. And that includes, of course, targeted temperature management, blood pressure management, very important for you and probably new for the most of you. I'll come back to those details also. Carbon dioxide and oxygen management, we discussed that already a little bit yesterday. Optimal hemoglobin, very, very, very difficult in these kind of patients. And of course, there is early outcome prediction and I won't cover that in this lecture. And then the last thing, of, of course, you have to prevent and treat some of the CPR-related adverse effects. There are definitely CPR-related adverse effects. For example, aspiration, infection, gastrointestinal ischemia, and uh, delirium, of course. Now, if you, look, if you look carefully at the most important causes of death once a patient has actually reached the ICU, it is post-cardiac arrest, shock, 35%, and brain injury, 30, 65%. So those are definitely the two most important. And you can see that of all the patients that come into your ICU, approximately 65% will still die. So it's still a very high death rate. Now let's start with the hemodynamic resuscitation first, a very important thing. Um, quite a few patients, after, let's say, it's acute myocardial infarction, as is the case with Luke, uh, approximately 5 to 10 percent of those patients end up with cardiogenic shock. And it's usually present in 50 percent at hospital admission, and 50 percent it develops while they're in your ICU. And you can see, actually, that mortality is still very high, around 50 percent. And of course, you know the main causes. It's 80 percent left ventricular failure, and then around 10% uh, mitral regurgitation and ventricular septal rupture, and then a few small other causes. Now, there is one very important thing that we should do, and this is this, of course. That is the early revascularization. Uh, and we know that already from the last century. That's a very, uh, qu quite, long, quite a time ago. Uh, but if you do an early PCI, or in some cases it's even early cabbage surgery, it's sometimes necessary. Then that was actually shown that the six-month mortality is actually lower in the early revascularization group compared to medical therapy alone. And last year, and that's also very important because patients usually have quite a lot of lesions in the coronary arteries, but last year it became very clear that you only have to treat the culprit lesion only. So the lesion that is actually causing the myocardial infarction and not the other lesions. And if you do that, you can see that the survival, this is mortality over here, that survival is definitely better in the first few weeks, and it stays so for actually one year in the culprit lesion only PCI. So that's a very important thing. 
Now, the second important thing, of course, is the hemodynamic stabilization. And I like to pick out a few things for you that I think are very important. And the first one is fluid therapy, something that you might not think of, which is actually very important to remember next time you see such patients. Most of cardiac arrest patients with an acute myocardial infarction are hypovolemic, even if they have extensive pulmonary edema. And that's the reason why they are um, hypovolemic, actually. When you have a myocardial infarction and the pressure inside your left and right atrium increases, then, of course, you lose fluid inside your lungs. You have acute pulmonary edema. And actually, 10 to 15 years ago, we measured the amount of fluid that gets into the lung and comes for your circulation. And that's around 5 to 750 mils. So immediately with, with pulmonary edema, you lose 5 to 750 mils from your circulation. If the pressure in inside the veins, your central venous pressure increases, of course, you lose fluid in the tissues. And also, very important for you to remember, a patient with a myocardial infarction has a systemic inflammatory response, which has the same level as a patient with moderate or severe septic shock. It's the same amount of inflammation inside the body. And then, of course, you also lose fluids inside your tissues. So these patients become hypovolemic. And it has been shown many, many, many times. And this is the most elegant study. It's already 40 years, of, I'm almost 50, 40 years old. Um, this is a control group. This is plasma volume. And these are the patients in early cardiogenic shock. And they have a lower than normal plasma volume. So they need fluids if they're hemodynamically unstable. And of course, we have to be a little bit careful, but they definitely will need fluids in the beginning. What about inotropic agents and vasopressors? Well, I can tell you that norepinephrine is still the vasopressor of choice. And that comes from two important studies. The first one we all know, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure. It was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that actually showed that norepinephrine is probably the best vasopressor in every type of shock. But it was statistically significant in the group with cardiogenic shock. So this is very important. And of course, norepinephrine had far less supraventricular arrhythmias than dopamine. So that's another reason why you should choose for norepinephrine. Last year, Norepinephrine was compared to epinephrine. And you already heard yesterday that epinephrine is not very useful during resuscitation, but it's probably also not very useful after resuscitation if you're in cardiogenic shock. Because the amount of patients that actually remain in refractory cardiogenic shock with epinephrine is much higher than in norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is definitely your first uh, choice. Then in a rare situation, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this only shortly, in a very rare situation where immediate PCI and, and, and inotropic support does not work and the patient deteriorates, then of course you have the option for a ventricular assist device, mechanical support, and I think in the Netherlands or almost worldwide, we choose now mostly for um, uh, VA ECMO in that situation. And of course, if a patient with cardiogenic shock gets into cardiac arrest, you could also choose for VA ECMO, so-called eCPR. But I definitely think that should not be standard of care right now. It seems very promising. These are the five studies from 2018. Quite a number of patients already, let's say 461 patients already treated with eCPR. It's almost incredible. And you can see that the survival rates are reasonable between 20 and 45%. But before we start introducing that in the Netherlands as a normal therapy, standard of care, I think we need this randomized control trial before we should do that. It's uh, quite a lot of work. And um, we want to be sure that that's actually helpful for our patients. Now, let's go into the second most, for me, the most important thing, of course, and that's the brain. 
Uh, it's nice if a patient survives, but it's even better if he has a very nice brain afterwards. So that's, uh, of course, that's the main, the main thing in the ICU. And you know, that's the one thing that we have done the last 10, 15 years, that targeted temperature management is the, main, the mainstay of treatment in the ICU right now. And it doesn't matter much, and I'll, this, I'll treat this only shortly, um, it doesn't matter much if it's 33 or 36 degrees, um, death at 180 days is the same, uh, cerebral outcome is the same, serious adverse effects are the same. You can actually choose what you want to do. And I think maybe most in the Netherlands now use the 36 degrees and we still in Nijmegen uh, still use the 33 degrees. And it doesn't make any, there's no difference also in, in the quality of life in the survivors. Uh, so it doesn't matter much. But it is a very important thing at least to do. But there is more. There's far more than only targeted temperature management. And I think this is the thing that I really want to teach you and tell you. And that's the things about how can we further improve the brain after a cardiac arrest. And let me tell you a little bit about cerebral blood flow. Uh, all the tiny little details in the ICU. What happens with the patients after cardiac arrest concerning his cerebral blood flow? And this is what actually happens. So, of course, the patient arrested somewhere here. That's where he arrested. And then he came into the ICU, and then we have to put in some limes, and it takes us some time, of course. This time point zero is actually three or four hours after the cardiac arrest. And this is the time, of course. And then you can actually see that blood flow to the brain is actually low in the beginning, and it only starts to normalize. This is almost normal after 12 to 24 hours. So a patient who is resuscitated, has a normal blood pressure, has a normal cardiac output, still has a low cerebral blood flow in the first 12 to 24 hours after cardiac arrest. And of course, that could further damage the brain. That's one possibility that this could further damage the brain, actually. Although, and that's important, we were unable, these are all studies done by our unit, we were unable to show that there was actually cerebral ischemia going on. If you look at the jugular bulb venous oxygen saturation, and that's blood coming only from the brain, it's actually in the normal range, despite the fact that cerebral blood flow is low. So there is no evidence from this that we actually have cerebral ischemia after the heart starts beating again. We tried to see that in another way, and I think this was one of the most important studies what we actually did. We looked at a very sensitive, I won't explain this to you, but this is a very sensitive measure of anaerobic metabolism of the brain. So anaerobic metabolism of the brain. And we compared the patient who remained comatose with the patient that actually woke up and went home uh, pretty well. And we were unable to see a difference between the two groups. So once again, we had to conclude that continuing cerebral ischemia is probably not a major problem in most patients in the ICU after they have been resuscitated, but still, you can see that there are quite a few patients, these are the standard deviations, that actually do have uh, cerebral ischemia or the possibility of cerebral ischemia. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So what could we do further to enhance recovery of the brain? And one of the most difficult, but probably one of most of the important things is the blood pressure that you have to aim for after your cardiac arrest. And if you look at the EHA, the American Heart Association guidelines, they state that the blood pressure should be above <coughs> mean arterial pressure, above 65 millimeters mercury, and the AOCOR guidelines say it's 65 to 70. They are actually quite low. And I'm personally convinced that this is wrong. I think there is more than enough evidence now to state that the blood pressure should be a little bit higher. And I'll give you the evidence uh, for that. If you look at the systematic review, that's from 2015, and I'll show you the latest data on the next slide. Uh, it was already shown that seven of the nine studies 
show the positive association between a higher mean arterial blood pressure after cardiac arrest and a better neurological outcome. It's not a randomized control trial. They have never been done up to now, but there was a positive association with a higher blood pressure. And then, of course, the other important thing, and I will show you that because it's, it's really, I think, very important. Of course, you want to aim for an individual optimal blood pressure. What should the blood pressure be in this particular patient? And if you look at severe traumatic brain injury, we're doing that. Patients with severe traumatic brain injury who have an intracranial oppression measurement and have a mean arterial blood pressure, we correlate blood pressure with the intracranial pressure. And the correlation coefficient gives you something about an optimal blood pressure for that individual patient that is shown over here. This patient has an optimal individual blood pressure of 100. And I think we should also do that in patients after cardiac arrest. And I'll show you on the next few slides. Now, this is the most recent study from Critical Care Medicine from this month, January 2019, looking at outcome after ROSC in relation to its blood pressure. And you see the blood pressure. It's the mean arterial for the first, first six hours after the cardiac arrest. And here you see the increasing blood pressure. And here you see the amount of patients that actually awoke with a good neurological outcome. And you see it increasing. And when they compared a mean arterial blood pressure for the first six hours of 60 to 90 versus a group with a mean arterial blood pressure above 90, if you did that with vasopressor, yes or no, if it was in hospital or out of hospital, if it was ventricular fibrillation or non-shockable rhythm, etc., etc., it doesn't matter. Outcome is always better if your mean arterial blood pressure in the first six hours is above 90 millimeters of mercury. It may be bad for the heart. Yes, I, I, I can realize that, but it's probably good for the brain. And now the most important thing, there was only one study that looked at individual blood pressures for a patient after cardiac arrest. And that's a study from Amelot from Belgium. Um, and I talked you through it. So this is the correlation coefficient between cerebral oxygenation measured with NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy, and MOP. And what you should realize is that the lowest correlation coefficient correlates with the best amount of autoregulation and probably the best blood pressure for that individual patient. And then you can see that patients with a disturbed autoregulation after cardiac arrest had an optimal blood pressure, mean arterial pressure around 100 or 105. And the patients with a normal autoregulation had an optimal blood pressure around 80 or 90 or even a little bit above. That's far more than the AHA guidelines and the ILCO guidelines right now. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we need a randomized control trial with different blood pressures. But for now, in Nijmegen at least, we are aiming for a higher blood pressure than we did, uh, we did before. So what about hemoglobin levels? Also very important, but because we are used now in the ICU to very low hemoglobin levels. Eh? The, the transfusion trigger is around 4.5 millimoles per liter, but that's probably not optimal in this situation. I don't know yet, there is no randomized controlled trial, but these are the data. If you look at hemoglobin levels over here, so 12 is around 7.2 or so more millimole per liter. And you look at cerebral oxygenation, it's definitely, it improves with higher oxygen level, with higher hemoglobin levels. But this is the most important one. This is also a U-shaped curve, as you can see, a bell-shaped curve with high hemoglobin levels having a worse outcome and low hemoglobin levels having a worse outcome. But the optimal hemoglobin level with the highest outcome is around 7.2 millimoles per liter, much more than our 4.5 that we're aiming now in the ICU. So that's also an important thing. Hemoglobin levels could be, should be, maybe, we need a randomized control trial, but it could very well be that 4.5 or 5 is not the optimal level in patients who are resuscitated from a cardiac arrest. We talked about oxygen yesterday. 
oxygenation yesterday. And you heard that during the resuscitation process, give them oxygen, and after the resuscitation process, titrate it down. You don't need so much oxygen anymore. That could be true, but I'm not completely convinced because these are the data. So this is the probability of death, and this is in the ICU, very large series of patients. And then, of course, you can see that if you go to hypoxia, mortality increases. And you can see that if you go to hyperoxia, mortality also tends to increase. It's not statistically significant, but it tends to increase at least. But look very carefully. That only happens with PaO2s around 250 or 300, levels that we normally never see in the ICU. So I'm not pretty sure that this is actually a, a major problem. I'm still very worried about hypoxia in that situation. And I'll show you the latest data in a few slides. What about carbon dioxide? First, you have to realize that even though a patient is comatose after a cardiac arrest, CO2 regulation in the brain and his vasculature is completely normal. These were data that we, um, that we did in uh, 2010 already. This is the relationship between CO2 and cerebral blood flow, and you can see that this is completely normal. So, meaning that if you hyperventilate the patient a little bit, cerebral blood flow will go down, and if you hypoventilate the patient a little bit, cerebral blood flow will go up. It's very important. They're, very, they're still very sensitive to carbon dioxide uh, changes. So what should be the normal? What is the optimal carbon dioxide level? I don't know yet. Uh, this is the study from Circulation, 2013, and they showed that normocapnia is probably the best. So this is poor neurological outcome, 57%. And you see that if a patient is hypercapnic in the first 24 hours, or hypocapnic, or both, that outcome gets worse. So normocapnia appears to be the best, but this is very recently, this is from intensive care medicine from this month, and this is really very interesting because what they did, this is a randomized control trial, and now they used two different levels of CO2 after cardiac arrest in the ICU. What should you do? 4.5 to 4.7 kPa or 5.8 to 6.0 kPa. And you can see that definitely oxygenation of the brain is much higher in the higher um, carbon dioxide group. Although markers of cerebral damage were not definitely different between the two. And the same is actually true for hyperoxia. This is moderate hyperoxia, 20 to 25 kPa. And this is normoxia, 10 to 15 kPa. And cerebral oxygenation definitely improves with higher oxygen levels in the blood. Well, what does it mean? Uh, I don't know yet. It only means that you can improve your cerebral oxygenation by increasing your carbon dioxide level and by increasing your PO2 in the blood. And if that actually relates to a better outcome, I hope we'll see in the future. Now, some final issues, and then uh, just in time, very nicely. Uh, Remember that early pulmonary infection um, actually arises in up to 50%. In the Netherlands, of course, we have our selective decontamination of the intestinal tract, and that's very useful here. But also realize, and we've learned that this year, that if the percentage of ESBL in your hospital is increasing and it gets above 5%, then SDD is probably not as useful as we think. And so we we'll see what happens in the Netherlands for the next 10 years. 30% of all the patients after cardiac, they aspirate, and almost 40% experience pulmonary contusion after um, CPR. So that brings me to the final slide. Um, I think, of course, all comatose patients, all comatose patients after CPR, they should receive full hemodynamic support, including, of, of course, early PCI, and ECLS, if indicated, um, and, and if indicated uh, under stress that. The available evidence now points to aiming for a higher blood pressure. I think 65 or 70 is not enough 
in most patients after cardiac arrest. Uh, and we will see in the future if that actually uh, uh, stands true. Um, for now, I think it's reasonable to titrate FAO2 to, to maintain an, a level of uh, oxygenation around 94 or 98%. And for now, until we know better, aim for normal capnia. The optimal hemoglobin level is still unclear, but maybe a little bit higher than our normal ICU transfusion trigger. And I think you should expect and anticipate infections and uh, further pulmonary complications. Thank you very much.